Hi, my name is Kevin Rubel. And December's What's Neat starts now. The What's Neat Show is sponsored by Caboose, sharing our passion for trains since 1938. This is What's Neat for December 2019. I'm your host, Ken Patterson, and this month we've got a really good show. First of all, we take a look at Daniel Coombs' brand new layout that he's building. This is a modular layout that's designed to take him through his college days and on through his future, and he is definitely the youth of the hobby, so it's great to see what Daniel has built for us this month for What's Neat. We also study nighttime photography. James Regeer and myself have spent many nights in the past two months shooting a lot of beautiful photographs of different water modules that I've got here in the studio. We shot this gorgeous BLMA bridge the other day, just a stunning photograph. And we go over all the timing, how to set your camera, and how to go about doing a photograph like this so that you can enter your local NMRA contests with beautiful work. We also have James Regeer featured this month in a super great how-to showing how he animated some passenger cars using LEDs. Now he's very amazing at this and he breaks it down and shows us how to scratch build the circuitry, how to work with various size LEDs, and it's just amazing the segment that James has produced for us for this month's show. I also would like to thank Bachman and Lionel Trains for helping me do the segues, that's the segments in between the segments of video that are the how-tos, with some beautiful train sets that they had sent. Bachman had sent the Night Before Christmas G-Scale set and the Little Big Top Circus train set also in G-Scale. Lionel sent two sets, the Winter Wonderland set in O-Scale and the Santa Freight in O-Scale. Very robust die-cast models with radio control and Bluetooth control, whereas you can use your cell phone to control these trains. Now we're going into our ninth, our ninth year now of starting to produce the What's Neat shows, and I'd like to thank Caboose in Lakewood, Colorado, for sponsoring the What's Neat show for the past two years. It's a great store with great service, knowledgeable employees, and they also buy estates and collections now. So check it out for your Christmas shopping this year. Go to Caboose in Lakewood, Colorado or order online at mycaboose.com. So with that, let's continue on with the rest of December's What's Neat. for this segment of What's Neat. I'm at Daniel Coombs' home, and I'm looking at this beautiful home layout that he's built. And the amazing thing about Daniel, you'll remember he's on the podcast. He's the youth in the hobby. And Daniel's designed a new layout down here. We've shown photographs of his old layout in the past, which I'm probably running right now, of when it was a layout that was more or less a couple of four by eight sheets of plywood with a lot of track and scenery, and it was essentially your learning curve. Now you've designed something Whereas you're at that age when you know you're going to be moving out of your home. And there's a lot of other young modelers that are in the same shoes that you're in. So tell me about your design on this modular layout you've built, Daniel. It looks great. Hey, well, thanks, Ken, for having me on a segment on what's neat. Um, just, you know, my old layout, like, he's, like Ken stated, it was just a typical in the middle of the room. You had to walk around to get to anywhere. And as I said on the podcast, when I first told you guys that I ripped it down, I'm like, I was tired of it. It was old. It was time for it to go. New change. Modular design is what we got here. Um, the layout height is about, I think, 48 inches with the L-type legs that I'm using. Um, and then my max radius is about 28 inches and minimum 22. And also, of course, with it being module, I can have each module... Uh, Intercha well, not interchangeable, but the fact of it is, with it being modular, like you said, I can take it when I finally move out of the house, and then I can start a new, fresh layout for the second time after building this one. Um, 
you know you've built this where I bet you can take these outside and photograph them at some point. Now you were explaining to me earlier, tell us about the type of scenery you're planning on this. Yeah, so the scenery I'm planning is just a little bit of hills, countryside into corners and maybe the back area, maybe a little valley or a ridge. Um, I honestly, when I just put the track down and I realized two days ago that it's like I don't really have enough room for a suburban setting so I might make it kind of ruralish, kind of out there countryside. Um, I might put a tunnel somewhere, I don't know, maybe back here. It's still in the works. Right. And now I noticed your bench work. You spent some time building these legs. You really worked on the bench work. Tell us about these legs and the bench work. Yeah, so the legs design came from the old layout that I had and it's, of course, the two pieces of wood that's at a 90 degree angle but with three 45 degree triangles, top, center, and bottom so it gives the leg the extra durability and stability. And another thing I got on the bottom of these legs is furniture glides. And we actually got some somewhere, I don't know, I didn't bring them out. They're like leg levelers, right? Yeah, leg levelers. They're just simple clockwise, counterclockwise, right. adjust it as you need. Right, that's fantastic. So you can adjust the height of each one in the event that these modules can be made up with other modules down the road, right? Mm-hmm. That is correct. Now tell us what kind of track you chose to use and why. Code 100 Atlas Flex Track, and I know Code 83 is more popular, but Code 100 Flex Track, yet it's a little bit more inexpensive than the Code 83. Code 83 prototypical, yet it's very pricey. So I decided just to go with the track and start out, because this is technically my very first that I've actually done myself, because that original one that I had before that we're standing, like, we're standing right here. Yeah, it was right here. Right. It was basically my dad built the bench work, and then it was just my learning curve of first doing my first building of a layout. Now this one, laying out the track, and I'm using Woodland Scenics foam road bed because I didn't really want to fuss with the cork. And now going back to the Code 100 track, it's less expensive, and then it's basically a track I can just start with, learn how to lay a flex track, and then in my next layout, plan to do Code 83. No, I've used cork before. It tends to dry out after a period of years. This uh, foam black uh, roadbed from Woodland Seedings, in fact, does work. I used it on my home layout back, gosh, 20, uh, 2007, I think it was, when we were shooting a catalog cover, and I wanted to get something done quick on the outside wall. So it's great, great roadbed. Um, now, your scenery, you've got that covered. You've got everything where it's movable now at some point when you want to take this and move on to your next location where you're at. Tell me what's the biggest thing that you've learned from design of the first layout that you've got to what your modular layout now is. What's the most, what's the best <laughs> advantage of what you built now? Oh, there's a lot of things I'm flashing back to, but the one main thing I found is plan and do one step at a time. The other layout, I kind of just went, it was built, track was laid, and I just went right to scenery, and then after that, it just quit for two years. It was deteriorating. It was kind of just getting all in a kind of a crappy crusty state and I just didn't like it okay so one thing I would suggest plan ahead like do one step bench work foam track wire it up make sure it works then go on to your scenery what are you using to power this layout well I'm actually using Digitrax uh, DCC and however I do have the NCE power cab that I use over at my test track over there with my Digitrax uh, PR3 programmer and I've got the Digitrax wireless uh, Wi-Fi system that I think I did uh, December 2017, I think, on how to install the LNY with the Digitrax Evolution DCS210 command station and a few wireless throttles here and there. Well, that's amazing. When I was starting out, we used Tech 2 Power Packs or the Tyco <laughs> Power Packs. I mean, right. I'm talking 1976 mm -hmm. when I did my layout. And you're so far advanced that you've got two systems, Digitrack and NCE, so you understand the difference between both of them. Which one, I'm guessing right now, you've got blocks, you've got this all set up so it can come apart. Um, what type of signals are you planning on using on this? Have you thought about that? Yeah, well actually, it's, the company's been around a while, it's called Azatrax, A-Z-A-T-R-A-X.com, and they're basically a simplified signaling system, almost not entirely plug and play, but they're boards, you basically don't have to get a gigantic signaling board that we're all used to, like Digitrax, SC8C, right. and have to spend about $100 for that and complicated wiring. It pretty much simplifies it more to where you take your signal wires, you wire it into the board, then you take your track feeders or your detection blocks and then you individually insulate the different blocks that you want the signals to occupy and to show status to where a train is. Now I'm going to go a little further down in scenery. Are you going to use static grass, ground foam? Are you going to use the Woodland Scenics uh, pecan ballast type ballast? Are you going to use real rocks? What are your thoughts about the future on your scenery design? 
Oh, yeah, you know, we are thinking ahead. Um, I'm just going <laughs> to use Woodland Scenics. I, and I actually might implement Static Grass because I think Campbell Rice talked me into it. Static Grass? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, as he mentioned, I think on his last podcast with him just building a new layout. But we're going to go ahead and just do Woodland Scenics Ballast and other Woodland Scenics products. But I'll try the Static Grass and patches here and there and see how I like it. That's amazing. And what do you think the overall size of this whole layout is? It's similar to what you already had, but just guess the area you're taking up. Yeah. Um, so in this corner here I got in the basement, it's about 10 and a half, maybe 11 feet by, I want to say, oh, seven feet across. That's amazing. Double track with a passing siding, it looks like. Are you going to have any type of industry? Do you model for the run-by effect? Or are you going to eventually make an operating layout? What are your thoughts on that? Probably 50-50. Both as enjoyable to run it, and then I'm in part of an op session group uh, every Tuesday night here in St. Well, not every Tuesday night in St. Louis, but it's Tuesday night op group, ops group. Right. We go to these gentlemen's layouts that they right. have. Of course, you had experience, but you're not an operations type. I of guy. don't have the attention span to operate. People <laughs> yeah. know that. Yeah, and then uh, James, who's holding the camera, also goes to the Tuesday night uh, op sessions. And I kind of just been around it for about two and a half years now. That it's like, you know what? I'm going to give it a shot. I'm going to think about maybe getting Micromark uh, car card system that they've got. And okay. I know Micromark is a sponsor. Long time ago, right. Podcast. So I might grab the car set, uh, routing system from them and give that a shot. That's very interesting. So here we are. Here's the youth in the hobby designing a brand new layout from the ground up based on what he knew before from the old 4x8 plywood type layout. And I've got to tell you what, Danny, you've got a great start. So thank you very much for doing this segment with us for What's Neat. This is going to run in our December show. All right. And uh, it's wait. awesome. Yeah, thank you, Ken. Appreciate and that's it. this segment for What's Neat. <laughs> For this segment of What's Neat, I'm in the backyard in the middle of the night. You guys know how that operates. And look at that beautiful moon right behind me right there. And tonight we're trying to take full advantage of this moon. I've got James Regeer with me. You'll remember James from the podcast, the What's Neat This Week podcast that we do every single week. But for this segment of What's Neat tonight, we're going to do a segment on photography. And James is using a Canon camera. Tell me, James, what kind of camera are you using tonight? Now this is a Canon 5D Mark III um, SLR, and it's it's a fairly stock lens that I have that I have on it. Um, so I'm what I'm doing right now. I'm doing a doing a shot of the locomotive coming down the track. So hopefully we'll get the rail reflections. Um, we'll get all of that uh, going on. So what we're doing tonight is a photography session on nighttime photography. And you've seen me do that in shows in the past. One time we used flames to light up the background of this Atherton shot, which was kind of really cool. And other times I've been just out here explaining how I shot some soundtracks, Amtrak photographs one night, and I was explaining the timing on things. James and I are both using bulb on our cameras. We're using these manual DSLRs that you're very, very familiar with. I've been using my Nikon. Uh, D2XS for going on, gosh, gosh, since 2007. And it's still a great camera for shooting great ad photography for the model press. But tonight's different, it's night. So that's when we set the camera on bulb. And we're using our minimum aperture of each lens. I think James's lens would bring it down to f22. And my Nikon brought the lens down to about f28, which gives you ultimate depth of field on the diorama, which is very important to keep everything in focus. As you see tonight, we're shooting some FP45s and an F45. And these locomotives both have LEDs installed, which is part of a video that we made for the December What's our November 2019 What's Neat on LED installations. So we're shooting these locomotives tonight just to expose how amazing the LEDs do look and taking, of course, full advantage of our moon in the background. Now, to further illustrate exactly how to set your camera up, for a shot like this, and I'm not talking cell phones, although if your cell phone has manual parameters, you can do this. And that is shut your aperture all the way down, F28, F22, whatever your smallest aperture is. Set your ASA on the camera for 100. That'll give you absolutely total sharpness in the grain on the shot. And then you set it for bulb. And James has been shooting 
four minute exposures for the last couple of days out here and they've been working out really well for him and with my Nikon at f28 I've been shooting six minute exposures and so let us share with you a couple of the shots that we've gotten off of these shots here's a shot of the locomotives from one side looking straight on I think we put this one on Facebook didn't we James yeah oh yeah it's going on Facebook and and then, James, tell us what you did with these Walther's passenger cars. You set up some shots, and you shot three beautiful shots. Tell me each one of these shots. Well, so I just took the uh, observation car from the uh, from the Super Chief, um, the uh, Cotto business car that I had, I did up with LEDs, um, and uh, the El Capitan tail car. And so I did all three of them, along with a couple of the other cars in the consists, and just set them up and shot them. You've got to love that red crimson on the water. So again, same timing on your cameras, same exposures we've just discussed. Um, experiment. And make sure make sure you remove any filters because you'll get some nasty cam lens flare if you leave those filters on and the, and the light reflects off of the lens and onto the filter. You know, that reminds me of one thing while we're hearing coyotes in the background right now. But the fact is, if you do have a lens outside at night, you've got to quantify that there's going to be dew settling on your lens. And during the exposure, you can actually wipe that off and that won't be picked up in the shot. So other than that, James, we want to talk maybe about lighting. We used a flashlight to light up the side of a lot of these locomotive shots that we've shown you. And we also used the house lights in the back of the house here, these very bright spotlights that are on the house. For about 10 seconds, we turn them on and turn them off just for some fill light on this water scene that we've been using, which is a long trestle scene. But otherwise, experiment, have fun with it. There's no better way to win a photo contest at your local NMRA event than to come up with something really interesting other than just straight daylight photographs. So James Regeer and Ken Patterson on the Bluff, we're signing off for this segment of What's Neat. <laughs> Hi, I'm James Regeer, and for this segment of What's Neat, we're going to take a couple of Bachman old-timer passenger cars, and we're going to convert them into Christmas cards. I have here a combine baggage passenger coach, and I have a regular passenger coach. We're going to use LEDs, we're going to use rectifiers, we're going to use resistors to convert these into well-lit Christmas coaches. I made the original Christmas coach from a Bachman old-time coach that was sitting on a siding at the Magic House. It was a lone car on the layout that did not seem to match or fit with any other rolling stock, yet seemed too nice to take off the layout. But a Christmas train seemed to fit the bill for this car because it has a lot of non-traditional cars, non-traditional loads to begin with, while the old-timey feel is kind of a neat touch. The techniques I am using can be applied to a wide variety of cars or coaches. The only limit is your imagination. The first step was to figure out exactly how I wanted the model to look. I knew I wanted to simulate a strand of Christmas lights around the top of the coach, and I wanted a scheme that would capture a Christmas-like feel, meaning red, green, and some gold, maybe some white lining. And before I did anything else with the model, I drew a mock-up of it, using a graphics program on my computer to allow easy experimentation with different color schemes, different stripes, different hues, and even lighting arrangements before actually putting anything down on the car. Once I had the basics of the paint scheme figured out, it was time to return to the model, where I began with thoroughly dis dismantling it, removing screws holding the couplers, then screws holding the trucks, and I was sure to keep all parts and screws in a safe place since I would need to be using them again. The body is held on the chassis by a clasp on either end. Working on one end at a time, gradually push the clasps toward the center of the car and push them downward to pull the shell off. Once one end is free, work on the other end. After the body is removed, locate a screw on either end of the interior and loosen it to free the roof. With the roof removed, working from the top, remove the window assembly. It's a tight fit, kind of a clear plastic box, that will slide out easily enough with constant level pressure. Once you've removed the clear uh, window box, go ahead and put it in your scrap box, because we will not be reusing it for this car, because it will actually interfere with the LED wiring. 
Finally, returning to the car's chassis, take a pair of needle nose or even tweezer nose pliers. Your tweezers won't actually give sufficient grip and pull the trusses out of the chassis and set them aside. Do the same for the handrails. Use enough pressure to get a good grip, but not enough to crush the plastic pieces. Similarly, use enough pull to get them out, but be careful not to use too much pull because they could break. As always, put these parts in a pl safe place so that you can use them again later. At this point, it's a good idea to get the car's measurements for LED placement. Use a caliper to measure height and length of each side, then measure the gap between the end of the car and the first window, then the height and width of each window, the distance from the top of the car to the top of the window, and the spacing between each window. For the combine, you will want to measure between the last window and the baggage door, and then the baggage door height and width, and then from the baggage car door to the end of the car, and of course, from baggage door to the top of the car. Be sure to write down each measurement for later use. I thought it would be neat to have open baggage doors on this model, which meant cutting them out. Using a number 4 X-Acto blade, I scored the outlines on the passenger door carefully and lightly until I was able to push the blade all the way through with minimal effort. Use care during this procedure so that you can preserve at least one of the doors for later use. Once the doors are cut out, place the coach bodies, roofs, and doors into a bath of 91% isopropyl alcohol to dissolve the paint. Allow it to sit in the solution for about 24 hours. While the coaches are soaking, we can use a computer graphics program to recreate the coach side with the measurements we took to create a pattern for our LEDs. The basic pattern we are using is a line of LEDs all along the roofline of a car, alternating between red and green. For the coach, this is a fairly simple arrangement with one LED centered above each window, one above each gap, and one on either end, for a total of 27 per side. Since the windows provide a natural reference for spacing, I did not find a printed pattern necessary for the coach. The coach baggage combine is a different story because it has only half the windows, so a pattern for the light string across the top is helpful. Besides, the baggage portion of the car offers a great deal of space that can loan itself nicely to an LED image. Think dot to dot, similar to what one might find on the Canadian Pacific Christmas train. Better yet, with the right hardware, we could even do an animated image. I thought a ringing bell might be neat for the project, and I found something suitable by googling Christmas bells, and I copied and pasted the image into the mock-up and drew an 11 dot pattern to represent one of the bells. Once I had a pattern, I copied it, pasted, and rotated 45 degrees and moved the pattern so that the top dot was shared between the two bells. The idea is that with one set of 10 LEDs, plus the common LED lit at a time, flashing back and forth, it would look like a bell ringing. Once the pattern is satisfactory, we print it, cut out the car sides, and set them aside. After the car bodies have soaked for about 24 hours in the alcohol bath, we can go ahead and remove them and begin scrubbing them with an old toothbrush to remove any remaining paint. It should come right off. Dispose of the alcohol as it will be full of dissolved paint and unusable for future paint stripping. Once the cars are stripped and dried, use painter's tape, I like using frog tape, to cover your car sides up completely. Spray the back of the masking tape with 3M Super 77 adhesive and apply the car side patterns, being careful to align the windows and doors to your car bodies. Cutting out a number of the windows with a number 4 X-Acto blade is a good confirmation that your patterns are aligned correctly. Once everything is set up to satisfaction, we can begin drilling our holes with the number 78 bit along the top of the car. Be sure to angle your holes slightly downward so that you do not wind up going into the plastic that stretches across the top of the car body. You will run out of drill before you run out of plastic if you wind up in that. Also drill our belt pattern on the coach baggage. I find that a pump action pin vise is very helpful dr for drilling these small precision holes because they actually allow you to concentrate most of your force on the very tip of the drill bit and in the direction that you're drilling 
rather than lateral side-to-side -side forces from many other pin vices that I've dealt with that can often lead to broken bits a lot quicker. Now because we're drilling so many holes, there's no way to avoid a few broken bits, so be sure to have extras on hand. Once drilling is complete, we can remove the patterns and the masking. At this point, we should make a few body modifications to the coach baggage. We want to take one of the doors that we cut out, sand it to remove any burrs, and using the chopper, we want to cut about one window's worth from each side of that door. We are going to want to remount the doors to simulate that the doors are open, having been slid backwards about two-thirds of the way to reveal the interior of the baggage compartment. Once we've test fit, we can go ahead and use Plastruct to cement the doors in. To make sure that the doors are flush mounted, we can use small scraps of sheet styrene glued to the inside of the coach body. Make sure you do not cover any drill holes during this process. We will also want to cut a piece of styrene to form a rear wall for the baggage compartment. The main function of this wall will be to help keep the wiring corralled into the coach portion of the car and to keep it from view. Use your caliper to get the interior height and width of the coach. You can then transfer your measurements to your chopper and go ahead and chop an exact wall for the back of the compartment. Be sure to use a block to make sure that the back wall of the baggage compartment is a square fit and then secure it with Plastruct. Using a similar process, cut strips to close off the windows in the clerestory of the car. With that, we give everything one more soak in isopropyl alcohol to remove any residue. An hour or so will suffice this round. Once everything is dry, we are ready to head to the paint booth. To me, a sky gray acrylic provides a nice, neutral base paint. Once the space coat has had a chance to set, we give the coach body and frame a coat of Tamina white paint. I like to thin my paints with 91% isopropyl alcohol until they are the consistency of milk. I use a pipette and a nearly empty canister of same colored paint. I don't have to worry about the paint residue in the container, nor do I take that into consideration if I use this, to mix usually one to one paint to alcohol. I use a Grex dual action airbrush with pistol grip with pressure set to about 18 PSI. The precise control over air and paint flow that the dual action uh, airbrush gives allows for a light even coat of paint. With the correct mix and a light enough coating, the paint will be ready for recoat and touch up within minutes. Recoat until satisfied. After dry time of at least six hours, we can begin masking. With an oven, things might go more quickly, but I generally like to be more conservative about dry times because if the paint is not solidified, the masking can pull it up. We want a white pinstripe belt line to go all the way around the coach. I decided to use an actual vinyl pinstripe for this purpose that I laid down and carefully burnished with a piece of styrene as I went. I did this for the coach and the baggage car. I wanted to have white steps on the chassis so I masked them off with masking tape and scored the masking tape into the crevices with a toothpick. Use care so as not to tear through the masking tape. Once everything was masked, I gave the coach one more coating of white to allow the white to seal the masking, while ensuring that any bleed underneath the masking would be the white that I was wanting. Dry time after this coating was considerably less, only about a half hour to an hour. This gave me time to thoroughly clean my airbrush by running pure 91% isopropyl alcohol through it until it sprayed clear. The next coat was Tamiya Red with similar procedure to the white. After dry time, I masked the ends and the steps of the chassis. Several strips of tape and careful burnishing were helpful in bringing the masking into conformity with the complex shapes of the steps. I masked off the windows and doors of the coach and burnished. I gave the coach body and chassis another coating of red paint to seal in the masking. I cleaned my airbrush and allowed everything to dry. I applied a coat of Tamiya aluminum paint to the trucks and roof. In cases where hitting all sides at once proved difficult, I allowed for a few minutes of dry time until I could touch it with my latex glove without paint rubbing off, before flipping the part over and spraying from the other side. 
I also decided that I wanted the undercarriage to be aluminum. When these parts were dry enough to handle, in this case only enough time for me to clean my airbrush, I transferred the aluminum painted parts to another piece of paper to dry completely. Finally, I gave the coach body a coat of Tamiya Field Green. I took my time and made enough coatings to make sure that no red paint was showing through. As always, many light coatings are better than one or two heavy coatings. Then it was a matter of cleaning my brush and giving it about a half hour to dry. After that, it was time to unwrap the present. Using a pair of tweezers and a great amount of care to avoid scratching the fresh paint, I pulled the masking off the car. Watching your envisioned paint scheme come into reality as the layers of masking come away is one of the most satisfying parts of any painting project. And with that, it was time to call it a day to let the paint dry completely over the next 24 hours. Once things had dried sufficiently, I decided to line the window and door frames as well as the trim and car braces in gold leaf for added flair. I tried this with a Molotov paint marker, though I ultimately found I preferred using Tamiya gold leaf applied with a paintbrush. Just be careful to use a very light, precise touch. The final step to the coach, before we get into the electronics, was window glazing. For this, I used clear plastic packaging. I airbrushed it with several clear Tamiya acrylics, including smoke, green, and blue, without cleaning the airbrush between the coats. Finally, I airbrushed with 91% isopropyl alcohol to make sure all the colors blended well. The goal was to create a bluish green tinted glass that would be transparent but still be dark enough to conceal the electronics inside. I then cut it into strips and glued it to the inside of the car using Micro Crystal Clear. Our next step is to adapt our wheel set so that they pick up power. We use Katie Centering Spring Plates for this. Straighten and spread their sides with tweezer nose pliers so that they extend straight out from the sides of the spring plate to form the wipers. Cut the spring plate at the mounting hole and use Kester 186 Liquid Flux to help solder 3-4 to four inches of gray AWG wire to the back of the spring plate. A helping hand may help you avoid burning your fingers. Glue the assembly into place on the truck frame with CA adhesive. Repeat the process for the other side of the truck. Reinstall the wheel sets into the frames, taking care that the insulated wheels for both sets are on the same side of the truck. Test for connectivity with a multimeter and adjust as needed. The wipers will add some friction to the wheels, but make sure that the wheels still turn freely. We will want to repeat this process for both trucks on the car so that all eight wheels are feeding power to the system. These Bachman coaches already have a single 1 16th inch hole next to the truck mounts. We'll want to drill another one on the other side of the mount to accommodate the second wire. Remount the trucks on the coach and string the wires through. For the coach baggage, we'll want to take some 1 32nd inch shrink tubing and make a conduit long enough to route the wiring into the passenger compartment. Cut about one inch for either side of the weight and install with CA adhesive. Once the adhesive is set, we can route the wires through it. Once the truck wires are through, the final step is to solder a quarter inch piece of k s number 8160 brass rod to the ends of the truck wires. Solder the wire before cutting the rod to make the process easier. Now let's look at the circuitry going into the coach and combine. The coach's circuit is basic, consisting of a rectifier and two strings of 27 LEDs each, wired in parallel. Each string has its own 1 kilo ohm resistor. In our fritzing diagram, we see each string of parallel LEDs represented by a single LED. The circuit will have no trouble handling all 54 LEDs in the car, however. All incoming power is routed through the rectifier, which will provide correct polarity for the LEDs, while the resistors will limit the voltage of, to the LED's 3-volt design tolerance. Regardless of whether we are running with DC or DCC, we should have no problem using track power. The circuit board for the coach actually serves as a starting point for the circuit that we'll use for the coach baggage. We will add an alternating LED flasher circuit based on a 555 timer chip. Place a 22 microfarad capacitor bridging from positive to negative. Always note the capacitor's polarity when installing. Place a 555 integrated timer chip in the center of the breadboard. Note that the divot on the 555 is to the left. Wire pin 1 to the ground or negative. Wire pin 8 to the positive. Add a wire connecting pins 2 and 6. 
Place a 2.2 kilo ohm resistor to connect pins 7 and 8. Place two 47 kilo ohm resistors wired in series between pins 6 and 7. These dual 47 kilo ohm resistors dictate the rate of flash for the LEDs, with the flash rate increasing with resistance. Place a 10 microfarad capacitor with its anode on pin 2 and the cathode connecting to the ground. Finally, connect two 1 kilo ohm resistors on pin 3, with one resistor going to an LED anode, whose cathode is connected to the ground, the other going to the cathode of an LED whose anode is connected to the positive. The behavior of this circuit, when powered, should be exactly like the breadboard I've set up on my workbench. The two LEDs, representing the strands along the tops of the car, remain steady, while the two LEDs representing the bells alternate. With the circuit boards all set up, it's a matter of assembling the LEDs. For this project, I am using all 0402 warm white LEDs that I paint to the desired color. I find it helpful to line up the LEDs with their anodes all facing away from me. That way, the blue wire always goes to the side furthest from me, and the red goes to the side nearest. Working in batches of about a dozen, I solder the LEDs, twisting the wires upon completion. I use a toothpick to paint the LEDs in the clear acrylic color of the batch, usually alternating between red and green, though smaller batches of 10 for each bell are painted orange. While the paint on the first batch dries, I solder the next batch. And after painting that second batch, I add a drop of Micro Crystal Clear to each LED from the first batch, as well as another drop of paint. Now be sure to keep your LEDs separate for the drying process, because they will adhere together otherwise. The next step is to place these LEDs into the coach. As a rule, I work on one side of the coach doing one lighting function at a time. This helps avoid accidental wire crossing. I used the number 78 drill bit to clean out the holes I had drilled earlier, since the paint may have narrowed some of them enough to make passing wires through them difficult. Working along the top of one side, I put in LEDs alternating between red and green, carefully threading the wires through the number 78 holes. Once the wires are through, I gently pull them from the other side until the LED is snug against the car side. If the timing is right, the micro crystal clear will still be tacky enough to serve as an adhesive to secure the LEDs in place. I also put in the top LEDs for the bells. Because it is constantly lit, this top LED will be on the same function circuit as the light string LEDs. Once I have an entire lighting function laid into the side of the coach, I solder them into parallel, working in batches of four to six LEDs. I twist the light colored wires together, blue for anode, red or green for cathode, smear with flux, and solder. Once I have a batch soldered together, I use my Tech 3 to test the connection, being sure to set it to about 2 volts. I make replacements as necessary, and when all LEDs light, then I cut all the loose wires above the solder joint except for one of each color. I paint the exposed tin wires with silicone, and move on to the next batch. Once that batch is completed and tested, I use the remaining wires from the first batch to splice into the second batch and continue until the lighting function for the side is completed. With the final splice, I cut off all the loose wires and solder a 1 kilo ohm resistor and red wire to the blue function common and a black wire, black for negative, to the red. I cover the exposed wire and resistor with 1 16th inch shrink tube and then solder the ends of the wires into the female side of the pair of SIP pins. The procedure is similar for each bell function. I place the LEDs as I want them, I splice them together in batches of 5, I test them, and then I solder in resistors once the circuit is together. In the case of the bells, I use orange for the four bell and pink for the aft bell instead of red to denote the positive function. I always make sure I solder the red and the black from each function together into a pair of SIP pins so that I do not confuse any of the wires later on. Once all circuits have been installed successfully and tested well, then we can use double-sided foam tape 
to attach the circuit boards that we've been working on into place on the ceiling of the coach body. Then you simply plug in the SIP pins into their correct outlets. Then we plug the brass rods from the truck wires into their respective SIP pins. We take care not to cross wire. And then we are ready to reassemble the coach. Snap the body back on, careful not to pinch the wires. Then replace the handrails, replace the body trusses, and put the KD couplers into the pockets. Our Christmas cars are complete and ready to roll. James, you made this project look so simple, and to me it's very complicated. Well, you know, there's a lot of tips and tricks out there on YouTube and out there on the Internet. In fact, this uh, bell flasher was simply a grade crossing flasher redone, and you can, get the grade, you can get the formula for these flashers on YouTube, including some videos from Model Railroad Hobbyist. And from there, it's just a matter of being creative, um, being patient, and not being afraid to make a few mistakes on the way. That's amazing. So that ends this segment of... What's Neat. So Merry Christmas and Happy New Year to you all, and let's start year 2020 off on the right start on the What's Neat videos. Yeah. All of the model railroad products seen in this episode of What's Neat are available through Caboose in Lakewood, Colorado, or order online at mycaboose.com. <laughs>